I'm the head of uh, cyber defense and strategic programs in Airbus Cybersecurity France. I joined the cyber business about 10 years ago. At that time, cybersecurity was an emerging domain, which has grown into an extensive and uh, dynamic activity. So in this talk, we'll discuss what have been the major trends and strategic shifts in France along the 10 years, and how the French institutions and also our company addressed the new cyber challenges. And of course, what will be the next steps? Welcome to talk.cybercni.fr. So welcome to Talk Cyber CNI, the uh, monthly cybersecurity speaker series. Finally, we also have sound, which is very good. My name is Marco oliver -Pahl. I'm the head of the chair of cybersecurity for critical network infrastructures. And today we have the third and, uh, or even fourth and finally successful trial for the long awaited uh, talk on Airbus cybersecurity, 10 years of challenges and opportunities. And we had quite some challenges in the past with the hardware from my side and also other difficulties that we had. And therefore, I'm more than happy that uh, today I can uh, welcome uh, Nicola Razzi and Nicola Lorio for this talk. The speaker series uh, also made some uh, summer break and therefore I'm very happy for welcoming uh, many of you uh, online today and also on site. Uh, today we are at Euricom in uh, Nice in France, one of the schools I have uh, Institute in Telecom. And uh, the speaker series, as you know, has the goal to bring cybersecurity closer to a broad audience. So it's about informing you about challenges and opportunities of cybersecurity. And actually, we started the entire series with Airbus um, back uh, in uh, January, I guess. So let's just have a quick look. On the 16th of June in uh, 2020, we started the speaker series with Frederic Jules. And uh, therefore, I'm even more happy to welcome uh, today uh, Nicola Razi and Nicola Lorio from Airbus. So you uh, just heard the, uh, the trailer, you heard what the talk will be about. And uh, as usual, I will quickly introduce our two speakers. So the first is Nicolas Razi. Nicolas Razi graduated from Centrale Superlec and joined Airbus Defense and Space Division in the C2 and Secured Communications Business Lines. He is now the head of cybersecurity, defense and strategic programs for France. Welcome. And the second one is Nicola Lorio. Nicola Lorio graduated from FREI Paris, FRE Paris, and joined Airbus Defense and Space Division in the cybersecurity business line. He has mainly worked in the IT and mission system area, but with various experiences in the OT sector, such as in the telecom, media, and various vehicle domains. He is now senior expert cyber defense at the Airbus Cybersecurity Technical Office. And before we come to the talk, let me introduce this leader once again. I just have to copy the audio source from here because it was missing. So one second. Okay, now you should hear me again. Uh, but you're not seeing me, so one second. Da, da, da. Okay, this one. Okay, so now I'm back. And now I'm also back in my frame. So, as usual, we have this leader on the uh, 
left side of me, you see the link. So it's uh, cybercni slash 20. And uh, you can also just uh, click on the QR code here. I will uh, show it also throughout the talk. As usual, the format is that we have um, 45 minutes of presentation and then afterwards we have 45 minutes for question and answers. And so do not hesitate to connect to the second screen and to put all your questions in there. And that said, we come directly to the talk and I hand over to you, Nicolas and uh, Nicolas. Okay, so let's start with that. So I'm Nicola Razi, and uh, Nicola Lorio is, uh, in, is beside me. And actually, you will have two Nicolas for the price of one today. Um, we will talk about Airbus cyber, cyber security as it was in uh, the last 10 years, but there were also some changes in our organization. So we'll put that uh, a little bit before starting uh, really the uh, talk. So just to give up of uh, who we are, uh, Airbus cyber security was uh, in the part of Airbus Defense and Space, and Airbus Defense and Space uh, um, as a, uh, a program unit or a business unit that is called Connected Intelligence in which there are uh, some uh, secure communications, military intelligence, and of course, cyber security. So uh, along the last 10 years, our uh, business was twofold. First, there was a business uh, uh, focused on uh, big defense programs. And here we are uh, talking about a large program on cyber defense, cryptos, secure gateways, and so on. And the other part of our business uh, was the focus on services. And here we are more talking about uh, risk management, consulting, uh, managed services, such as a security operation center. And this is more a business that is focused on European institution, private companies, and the group Airbus uh, itself. And on the 1st of July, there was a new company called Airbus Protect that was created inside Airbus. So now there are two sister companies doing cyber inside Airbus. Airbus Protect is still focused on the services, delivering services to internal and, uh, and uh, critical national infrastructure. And we, Nicolas and myself, are working at cyber program, which is still inside Airbus Defense and Space and still focused on uh, and defense program. So this is more on this side that we'll uh, talk uh, today, but we'll uh, also uh, have a look at uh, critical national infrastructures, of course, and, uh, and the European institution uh, to some extent. Um, before uh, starting the talk, I would just like to talk to you, uh, take the opportunity to talk a little bit about our, uh, our um, teams, because we have fantastic teams and they are doing a great job and uh, I would like to thank them for that. Uh, here are a few, uh, a few pictures of them at the last uh, FIC event uh, in, uh, in Lille uh, when they carried out demos, uh, hacking uh, challenges and so on. So uh, if before anybody asks, uh, uh, yes, we have uh, really uh, good experts and we are, we are recruiting. So if anybody hearing is uh, is interested, there is all the information uh, necessary on LinkedIn to get in touch with our, our uh, HR colleagues. Now that it is said, uh, let's come back to today's story. Um, so Airbus Cyber Security, before it was a uh, cyber program and uh, Airbus Protect, was created about 10 years ago. And during those 10 years, uh, we, we thought that it would be interesting to, to take a step backwards to describe what, what happened during those 10 years in the cyber security, and especially in France, because uh, we are French, we are working on a French business. Uh, and of course, it won't be uh, fully uh, comprehensive because uh, we cannot uh, say everything in 45 minutes. So we we'll focus on specific uh, topics and um, uh, we, we, we will try uh, to some extent to, to have a look also at the European uh, landscape. 
So to put it in a nutshell, we will describe how the threats evolved along those 10 years, what strategic decisions were uh, taken by the French institutions at the and so on. But still, uh, for the first time, the word cyber was mentioned in this, uh, in this book. And it was mentioned only six times, but despite it was only six times, it's clear that the topic was already important because cybersecurity was uh, mentioned as a sovereign topic, meaning that it must be kept under control for the independence of the nation. And to some extent, it means that it's uh, put uh, at the same level or close to the same level as nuclear deterrence, ballistic missiles, or, uh, or nuclear powered uh, uh, submarines. So it's clear that the lesson from Estonia was heard, and that's not the only event, but that's, that was one of the events. And also this uh, white book mentioned the risk of a major cyber attack in the next year, in the following years, against the nation critical national infrastructures. It, it mentioned that it would be very likely to, to have this risk. So to put it in a nutshell, this white paper shaped the political and military view on cybersecurity for the for the following years, and there were some uh, very practical uh, consequences. For example, in 2009, there was a creation of the NSSI, which is the French National Security Agency, and this is this was done in the straight line of the recommendation of the of the white paper, and. Actually, there was already uh, an agency beforehand, but it was really focused on the military side. And this new agency focused on the protection progressively, uh, focused on the protection of the information system of the governmental bodies, and also on the protection of uh, the critical national infrastructures. And we'll see later how it, uh, it uh, grew. So it's important also to note that uh, the NSSI has a very specific position. It's really focused on uh, defense and protection, not on collecting information about, uh, uh, about uh, other stakeholders or on uh, offensive cyber. So this is very different from other national security agencies, uh, which, uh, such as uh, the NSA, for example. And this is a bit uh, reassuring for other stakeholders because it, uh, the NSSI uh, can easily work with uh, administrations, companies, uh, industries, or international uh, actors uh, we, without any uh, risk that they are thought of as, uh, as offensive. So this was one of the first decisions following the White Book. And then the, the NSSI delivered a national strategy for defense and IS security in France. So this strategy was, was uh, described four major uh, objectives that structured the, the way of how the cybersecurity would be ended. Through protecting sovereign information, that the critical national infrastructure protection should be strengthened, and that uh, security in cyber space should be ensured. So this was the, the main uh, backbone of this uh, strategy. And maybe it's up to you, uh, Nicolas. I, I would go to talk a little bit of two, two other big malware. The first one is Tuxnet in 2010, uh, which demonstrates that the, the cyber is used as a weapon against uh, the industry. So Tuxnet is a well famous one. It was um, done to uh, tackle uh, uranium enrichment, uh, so against uh, SCADA systems. So this is a really well famous uh, malware. You can find a lot of information around the, in the internet. but. Uh, in this big picture, this was still another eye opener because uh, it was another uh, proof, if we need some, that the malware, so the cyber, can be used as a, an offensive weapon to to tackle some some issue or to fight against some uh, other country. And we have another example, which is also sabotage in 2012, uh, which is uh, Shamoon. Uh, Shamoon was also uh, uh, a malware which was developed and mainly was targeting the national oil companies uh, in Middle East. 
particularly uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, there have been more than 30,000 uh, workstations which was uh, uh, just impacted by, by the attack. So this uh, has blocked it during two weeks. Uh, the, the company and the chairman did, did come back also uh, again in 2016, 17, and 18. So these two other examples with Estonia was three big examples among others, that uh, the, the cyber weapon is really growing as a, as a, as a strength, of, I would say, for, for some country. So this leads us uh, in the same part uh, that we, we decide uh, in reaction also in the Defense defense space to create a, a cyber security competence center. So this was a, a joint uh, of various people inside the Airbus Defense uh, Group from uh, French, UK, uh, Germany people uh, in order to develop the, the cyber business and try to protect the, this kind of industry, defense and uh, critical national industries. Uh, we also uh, did uh, do a, a huge program for the French MOD, uh, which was in line of the strategy, which is called uh, uh, MTD, which uh, stands for the technical means for uh, the, the, the cyber defense, I would say. So we were a, a huge provider that has been started in, uh, yes, uh, as we can see in the picture, 2011, and uh, we, we are delivering the two links for the, the French MOD year around yes, detection and cyber defense. And uh, 2012, uh, this was an, another big uh, date, I would say, in the agenda. It's a big, big A because uh, we, we go from uh, 10 just uh, uh, competence centers to uh, start uh, a company, a subsidiary, fully dedicated on cyber defense. For, for us, it was a new start in 2012 as a company purely dedicated to, to fight against cyber attacks for uh, MODs and uh, national uh, critical infrastructure, I would say. So, yes, just, just to introduce uh, the next year, uh, until 2012, uh, I would say that it was time to, to put down the foundation. And then the three uh, following years, uh, the, the focus was on the actual implementation, how uh, the protection would be put in place uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, protect against uh, cyber attacks. Yes, and one big decision in, inside the cyber security at this date, it was to join people inside the same building, inside the same department to create what we were calling at the at this stage, the cyber defense centers, where we were putting all people which were delivering uh, activities for cyber defense, which was uh, everything around the supervision operation center and also uh, uh, computer uh, security uh, incident response team. So we, we decided to put all these people uh, in addition also the other people which have to support, to deliver, to, to integrate the system inside the same building at the same floor. So this was a joint and extended team uh, together. It was a strong decision on the side. And uh, also this was uh, the, 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 the beginning for us, but we will talk about it a little bit later to not only tackle IT stuff, but also everything uh, among OT uh, because the, the perimeters tackle also OT uh, threats. So uh, part of the picture also, we did IPT1 report. Uh, it was uh, at uh, 213. The, 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 the IPT1 was the first report done by uh, Mordiop. Uh, it was uh, really a, a huge uh, I say discovery from those who were not that much technical. It was also another eye openers. Uh, and the reason why is when we, we had the report, in fact, the, the APT group was uh, at least acting since uh, 206. Uh, he has done more than 150 uh, victims over seven years. So uh, it was really a huge discovery for some in, in outside the industry uh, and really eyes open us that we can also have sabotage, as we have seen in the, in the slide before. But here we are also talking about espionage to steal data and stuff like that. So, and the average, uh, average, uh, I would say, time inside the network team was something roughly between uh, one to five years inside the victim before he just discovered that he is under attack. So it was really, really uh, an important uh, data. So the, the, this report for some in the industry. Um, 
Inside Airbus, we have seen that uh, just uh, as a slide before that we have done the, the, the MTL for the French MOD. Uh, the, the, during this decade, we have also done the, a tactical version for, for the, the technical means for a uh, SOC and detection purpose to deliver to the French MOD the capacity to go, uh, let's say, on the field with the means to do cyber defense purpose. So it was a rising chance also for every single operation with uh, uh, better tools, I would say. And uh, during that time, the national authorities carried on structuring their uh, approach and they released a second uh, white paper, which is uh, close, uh, the follow up of the one that was released in uh, 2008. And uh, actually, this one is much smaller than, than the other one, it's uh, three times smaller, but cyber, uh, cyber security is uh, mentioned uh, seven times more than the previous one, which shows that the importance was really increasing on cyber security, cyber security uh, especially in political concerns. So th this uh, white paper is very important also because it's the political foundation for the military programming law, and we'll come back to, uh, to that. Uh, this law uh, was to come the year after. And uh, about cybersecurity, this uh, white paper acknowledged that there was an increasing number of threats, and uh, also that there was uh, actors uh, that were really interested in using uh, cyber security for edge purpose, and uh, um, that uh, we needed to put a certain kind of answer to the threats on critical national infrastructures. So this means that some security cyber specific schemes were to be developed for critical national infrastructures, for example, compliance with uh, standards and uh, frameworks, uh, the need to put in some uh, specific detection device, uh, the need to declare security incidents to the national authorities, and also the possibility for the state to carry out uh, compliance audits and to ensure appropriate measures were implemented in, uh, in uh, vital uh, companies. And this led to the LPM, the military programming law. This is a legal transcription in uh, 2013, uh, in 2014 of the white paper in terms of law, law that applies to uh, every company. Uh, and this is called the military programming law, but this is goes beyond uh, uh, only military sector, and especially it applies to what are called the OIV, the operators of vital importance. It defines some uh, PIV, points of vital importance for the national infrastructure and so on. And see, this law, this law with, uh, with the law of the state and more particularly the NSSI to impose protection measure on private actors and on uh, CNIs. And this, this law allow also uh, opens the door to a national qualification, uh, for example, in terms of, uh, of uh, audits. Uh, there is the PASI qualification that, uh, um, that, that applies to, uh, to service providers uh, uh, for uh, audits. There is the PDIS qualification for the uh, service providers in uh, incident detection, the PRIS for incident response, and all those qualifications are delivered by uh, the NSSI. At the same time, there was a ramp up on national uh, ecosystems, the first hint of that, and we will see that uh, it's something that is very important in, uh, in the cyber security domain. So, for example, the Pool d'Excellence Cyber, Pool of Cyber Excellence in Brittany was initiated by the French MOD uh, along with the Regional Council of Brittany. And it also uh, includes uh, actors from uh, defense, industry, private, private and public sectors, uh, big industrials, SMEs, startups, and so on. So th this is uh, some kind of community that is focused on cybersecurity um, training, research, 
uh, development of innovation, um, support of trusted service, both in, uh, in France and in Europe, and so on. So to put it uh, in a nutshell, the role of excellence, cyber excellence is really a, a key actor for developing a sovereign and also European cybersecurity uh, ecosystem in Britain. The next point is uh, another uh, another uh, that's not an attack this time, but another event by uh, that uh, is linked to the release of uh, of some information, some leaks by uh, our friend uh, Stuart Snowden. So, what is important here is that uh, we understood, we learned, maybe we already knew to some extent before that, but we learned that the NSA was uh, using tools and processes, for example, to intercept for phone calls for millions of Americans to tap the phones of uh, ally leaders and especially in Europe. So this confirms once again that there is some kind of industrialization that is ongoing for cyber weapons and, uh, and there is some kind of race for those cyber weapons uh, ongoing. Next point is about uh, TV5 mode. So this is uh, actually one of our customers. So we'll speak a bit uh, more about that because uh, that's not often that we are uh, able to speak about what we can do and what who our customers are. But in this case, it's uh, public. So, so there we can uh, we can go. And I let, let Nicholas do that because he, he was uh, very much involved in that. And just, just hearing us not the, the most story we don't have time and we cannot disclose everything but yes we were part of the of the team the, with uh, joint with others we, we are not alone uh, inside the, 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 this event i would say but that it was a, a cyber attack which has tackled a, a french uh, tv which is uh, broadcasted over the world not only in france and many outside outside france i would say so there is a kind of uh, geopolitical impact behind the, this one and uh, because there are more than 200 uh, millions of viewers, I think, around the world. So it was really uh, an important impact because there is a black screen. Uh, and uh, for the, the TV, this is the worst case you, you, you can have. The Airbus was mainly implicated in parts of the, uh, I would say, uh, monitoring and rebuild phase. Uh, we were in partnership where we were doing the, the, the pure investigation. And we were there to support and uh, do the security crisis monitoring, as I was saying. And uh, yes, the, the build phase to, to, to support uh, uh, the reopening of all the service to, to have the continuity of the activities of the, of the, the TV. The, the, the main challenge was for, for us that we, we have said a few words uh, before that IT and OT, but yeah, it's, it was not purely IT because the, the, we, we were also in the kind of the OT world with everything related around the broadcast. And in fact, we need to secure and monitor not only the IT, the computers, the servers, which everybody is used to, but also to tackle the, the challenge we have to have some monitor, uh, I would say, transcend and uh, add some security around the broadcast part, which was not totally or fully designed for. So this was one challenge we, we have to face. And I think over the years, we will still have some challenge around this specific business. We were not security driven at the beginning. And I think there is a lot of study or research that can be done around the, the, the support, the security of broadcast, uh, broadcast stuff. Uh, we have the chance to, to have a lot of communication with, with them. And we have done, for example, a, a conference to get the feedback around the crisis management uh, at uh, Les Assises uh, 2015, which is a, a French uh, symposium, I would say, uh, which is running once a year. And uh, we, we have had the chance after to continue the, after the journey with the TV5 mode uh, because we are currently running the, the SOX for, for them. Okay, and if we have a look at the following three years, uh, uh, what uh, is uh, really uh, interesting to uh, understand is that uh, we will see a rise of new threats and also the ramp up of the cyber defense. Um, so speaking about threats, yeah. new threats, actually. Yes, new threats, it, it, it's not a new era, I would say, but uh, that, that some new threats are gaining mainstream for, for, for this decade or this part. 
uh, we have talked before that the Estonia menu was the denial of service. We have talked about sabotage uh, with the Stuxnet and Shamu. We have talked about APT1, so spying uh, espionage. And here we are going to talk a little bit about uh, influence and another one just after, and I guess 2016. Uh, a lot of hacking effort was done around the the election, so the Clinton staffers was uh, targeted by phishing mail to get inside the, the, the American election and try to to do some influence. So it was also uh, a new eyes opener because this one was really uh, famous also. So influence is part of the game as a cyber weapon, I would say, uh, uh, for the, the world at this uh, date. The, the other uh, topics is, yes, we can say WannaCry and, and not Petya. I, I won't say the rise of ransomware or the brand new ransomware, because if you want to do some a little bit studies, you can find the first ransomware, which could be uh, 1989 with uh, AIDS Trojan. So the ransomware is an old stuff, I would have said, but here is really the rise as a ransomware, as an industry, as a weapon to, to make money, and it's becoming mainstream. Uh, this is a brand new part, and uh, they are able to to move like worms to uh, to exploit and to go from computer to other computer as easily as they as they can do. So it's it's a big changer because they are using yes zero day or already existing vulnerabilities. Uh, they are tackling or targeting uh, from time to time some specific company, but for most of the time it could be for some or somewhere just opportunistic uh, target and. Uh, Yes, this is brand new and very important for, for us because it's, uh, it goes from uh, APT, which is, was just spying and the target was to stay under the radar, I would say, for years. And this one is not exactly the same because it's quite of, as quick as possible. You want to cipher everything and to, to ask for, uh, for money to, 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 to have your system up and running after, even if it's not always the case uh, after on somewhere. So this is... Yes, a new era for us because it's uh, yes, I was saying kind of quicker dot as they go fast and decipher everything. So we don't have a lot of time to to react. And then I spoke about uh, ramp up of the cyber defense, and this is symbolized by, by the creation of the French Cyber Command. So this highlights by that the cyber defense is growing as a global and strategic priority for the French Navy. And this confirms that uh, cyber is actually a new domain of action of, uh, for warfare. So the cyber is in charge of coordinating the cyber activities inside the MOD, in charge of protecting the MOD's uh, uh, infrastructures, but also in, 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 in charge, and this is pretty new, but we'll see that later, of the offensive cyber and cyber information warfare. We'll come to that a bit later. And the strength of the cyber defense was also reinforced by the uh, following version of the military programming law that was in 2019. And this uh, law strengthened the cyber defense regulations and imposed new uh, requirements on, uh, for example, uh, telecom service provider. We will need to have detection devices in, uh, to identify attacks on their customers. And also, it reinforced the resources and budgets for uh, for cyber defense. On our side, we develop new tools to uh, to um, to be more effective uh, with regards to cyber security attacks. Uh, I, I will speak quickly about the cyber range. This was initially an internal tool to support our uh, large programs, but this progressively grew into uh, some kind of agile and virtualized lab that was used for really various purposes. For example, for testing and evaluating uh, cyber products, uh, for uh, exercises and operational training, for simulating attacks on, uh, on uh, various systems. And uh, of course, for us, it's also a basis for our uh, innovation work, for our uh, organization of uh, events and uh, cyber uh, exercise, cyber changes, and so on. So this is really one of our uh, technological foundation, one of our uh, really uh, very used uh, products. And then in 2017, we, we, we were awarded by the NSSI the PASI qualification. I talked a bit about those qualifications earlier. So this one is for audits and pen tests, and uh, there are uh, five uh, 
domains for this, um, for this specific qualification. There is also a stronger version of the PASI uh, qualification that is really uh, compliant with the military programming law for uh, critical national infrastructures, and we got it at, uh, at the same time a bit later, I think. And then another thing uh, happened in 2018, we developed, we implemented a site in Rennes, so in the Britannia area. area. I talked to you earlier about the uh, Britannia ecosystem in terms of cybersecurity. We had people in Rennes since 2015, but uh, in 2017-18, we opened a new site. And uh, this is uh, something that is still growing, growing because last year we doubled the space that we, that we have in, uh, in uh, Britannia. And we, we did that, of course, because of the ecosystem, because we wanted close to our customers, to our partners, to, uh, to the innovative uh, uh, landscape in Brittany, to the academics, huh? and, uh, and Mark Oliver uh, knows that very well. Yeah, we, we, we have talked about the, the French uh, law, but uh, see one, I would say, big directive, the, the NIS directive, which was in 2016. It was the first step uh, in, in the European, uh, I would say, um, cybersecurity strategy. The, the, this one was trying to put some uh, some stuff we have already seen in the, the, the French law, but it was pushed by, by various countries around Europe. This is one trend of Europe that we, we are joined together to try to set up one common framework. And the, there was three main parts, I would say. Uh, the, the first one was to, to push for having some national uh, capabilities in each country, a kind of uh, national security agency or national uh, computer security and civil response team for, for each country to, to be able to tackle attacks and to coordinate the, their industry. The second one was to push and stimulate cross-border collaboration uh, between Euro countries. Uh, so the, the interconnection between the, the Euro sets and uh, the, 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 the set from Euro also. And the, the third one was to uh, a strong focus on uh, national supervision of critical se sectors to, to put measures and uh, supervise uh, national industry which are critical for, for the landscape. So this, yes, it was the first stage. We talk a little bit after. There is another uh, in Europe, but Nice is really the first strong step in the cybersecurity uh, strategy from Europe. And still in Europe, uh, in 2018, the European uh, institutions felt that they, would, they, they were uh, needing some kind of tool to, uh, to improve their security. So, so they released a, a framework contract to uh, allow uh, European institutions to protect themselves, uh, both uh, to uh, buy some expertise, to to buy some uh, security products, to buy some security projects. So there was a very big competition uh, for the European Commission. And actually, Airbus won it. So uh, uh, along with uh, with that talk, actually, but. Uh, Airbus is uh, is now uh, the 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 main uh, uh, well, in charge of the delivery of uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, expertise and uh, products to the to the European institutions, and there are something like seventeen European institutions that are uh, uh, using this contract. And we are uh, very proud about it. And then, if we come closer to our uh, to uh, the present day, actually, um, what we will see, uh, what we saw in the last uh, three years, I would say, that what is that there were new domains of cybersecurity uh, emerging, and uh, that the, the, the ecosystem also was uh, strengthening. So, uh, for example, we talked earlier about the cyber defense. This was released as a policy by the ComCyber in 2019. So this policy, of course, that's only the public elements of the policy, but it describes the organization and the, the mission uh, of the ComCyber on cyber defense. And uh, so it, it shows that the approach is more and more structured and uh, actually, in 2019, there were some uh, communication by the former uh, Minister of uh, Defense, uh, Florence Farley, 
and she said uh, in uh, one of her speech that uh, the MOD was uh, under attack uh, quite uh, frequent, frequently, and uh, the attacks were, uh, she, she talked about where uh, we are from in 2017, 2018, but still uh, it was uh, it was a very, uh, uh, interesting because um, the, the French body usually does not speak that much about uh, that kind of stuff. And then there they, they said that the attack was focused on the fuel supply chain for the Navy, for example, and they gave some, uh, some uh, information about how the, the attackers were, uh, were operating. So overall, this communication was, uh, it was not uh, uh, well, innocent, I would say. It was meant to uh, show that the MOD was ac acknowledged that the, the risk was growing and that the re reaction was, uh, was necessary, in particular in the scope of the offensive cyber warfare. And guess what happened? Uh, in the following month, there was a new doctrine that was released uh, by the MOD for the offensive cyber warfare. And this doctrine is only public elements huh, because most of it is uh, classified, but it describes the usage the MOD can do of offensive cyber. And it describes also, also the legal framework of usage. So now offensive cyber is part of the panel of warfare capabilities of the MOD and can be employed in uh, operations. Um, the general message is that the French forces will use it. And though they will uh, pay a very uh, specific attention of the international uh, legal framework, they, they won't fear to use it. Another thing that happened is that, well, that's so that was uh, that's, uh, even more uh, recent, uh, that in 2021, that the, the fact that uh, fake news uh, started to take a very big importance in, in armed conflict. In 2021, for example, the, the, body, the French forces uh, suffered from uh, disinformation in, uh, in the Mali operations, for example. Uh, obviously, this is a new topic because it was, uh, was already used uh, in the Roman Empire, but uh, the fact that uh, the there are some social networks it is, is a real major shift because it makes uh, the disinformation 1,000 times louder and it allows 1,000 more people to be able to release uh, false information. And uh, that the French forces learned uh, uh, on, the, on the battlefield actually. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, some uh, rumors were spread over the the social networks and the, the local population uh, was really um, 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 well uh, led into thinking that uh, that uh, the French forces were doing things that they were not doing actually, and uh, the bigger it is, the more people believe it. So it was. We were speaking about uh, eye openers. This was also an eye opener of what uh, misinformation, disinformation, cyber influence can do on, uh, on, uh, in, in warfare context. And uh, by the way, at the end of 2021, there was a new doctrine of cyber information warfare. So this is something that is very, very relevant for the MOD uh, nowadays. On our side, in 2019, we uh, joined the Cyber CNI chair. And, uh, thanks for that, uh, Mark Lever, we are pre very proud of that. And then we got the PDIS qualification. So, so this PDIS qualification was uh, very difficult to, uh, to get because it imposes to our uh, security operation center to have a very strong infrastructure and the very strong processes. But this opened the road to providing uh, security monitoring services to the CNIs uh, and uh, that to, to, to answer the requirements from the NSSI. So that's very important to, to have this qualification. 
attacks against the hospitals. I think that everybody knows about that. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, happened in the US in, uh, firstly, and then it came to France at the end of 2019, 2020, we could say. And uh, actually, um, this is still uh, up to uh, an up-to-date uh, topic uh, today, and we can see that in every uh, every day in, uh, in the new newspapers. Uh, in 2020, uh, seven, 27 hospitals were attacked in, uh, in France, and it's still uh, ongoing. So this is mostly uh, ransomware attacks, but it struck us all because uh, it has something to do with uh, human lives and the human lives were at stake. So this, uh, this is also some, some kind of change in the mindset, mindset of uh, attackers, I would say. Another important thing in uh, 2020 was uh, the, the launch of the France Relance Plan. So this was at the beginning of the COVID uh, um, crisis. And the plan de relance is mostly a recovery, recovery plan was, uh, was meant to reduce the economic impact of the COVID uh, sanitary crisis. But on the cybersecurity part, the, the, there was also a specific plan driven by the uh, NC and focused on local communities, public institutions, and uh, healthcare facilities, uh, and especially uh, hospitals. So overall, in 2021, uh, more than uh, 600 entities, different entities, benefited for, uh, from uh, this plan to increase their maturity in, uh, in cyber. And another thing that is worth mentioning, and uh, that's the creation of the campus uh, cyber. So it was in 2021. And uh, we in uh, Abba Cyber uh, joined the campus beginning of 2022 when the, the um, premises were, uh, were opened. And so this is a, an interesting initiative uh, supported uh, directly by the president, uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron. And uh, it meant that um, Developing synergies between uh, all the actors of cybersecurity in the, in the Paris uh, Paris uh, area, promoting sharing information, training, innovation, and so on. Yeah, during these year, these years, we have the chance to uh, join or effort, I would say, with the others in a research program. So you have two examples here, which is Safeguard and Sachi. Uh, I won't spend too much time on these two ones. You can Google the names and uh, go to the website, which is dedicated to these two topics, and you will see that we were Airbus plus a lot of other partners from industry and uh, research and, and universities and others. Uh, but these two examples is, uh, is proof that the, the Europe is pushing also for collaboration between countries on, on specific uh, studies. The state care was uh, all about the health care, so we, we try to support hospital in this case, uh, for example, part of the studies we have done was to try to analyze specific file format with uh, uh, outcome from the, the scanners, for example. So we were able to, to, to scan if there is malware which is embedded in this specific file format. But we were part with uh, a consortium, uh, uh, a seamless integration, the target was a seamless integration between obviously the OT or the physical part and the IT of uh, an hospital to have I would say a broader view of what's running on the security level in, in, uh, in a hospital or healthcare environment. The SATIE, I would say it's, uh, it's, it's the same purpose. The target was also to tackle the security, physical one, and the IT security and OT security uh, in the same uh, I would say dashboard to have a broad view. And it was related to airports, uh, for example, we are in enabled with the Athens airport for, for, for the studies. And uh, the, the target was just to to prove that we can have a, a, a broader view and specific uh, duties and OT part of this airport infrastructure, which is much more complex for what we, people can see uh, when you are just going to take uh, your plans and to connect all security measures from physical to IT and to OT together to have a broader view. And also this one was done with a consortium. You can find it in, if you Google in the internet, uh, the name. It was done thanks to European uh, research framework also. So the Europe is pushing, is putting some money on its part to, to support their industries. And not only for, uh, I would say, civilian industries, but also uh, also uh, for the military purpose, uh, the, the, this one is uh, EDIDP, uh, European Defense Industrial Development Program, uh, which is now uh, the European Defense Fund, uh, because the 
system uh, changed and the actual level of investment uh, has changed. And the, the, the idea behind was to uh, first initiative to uh, joint various uh, military actors from various countries in Europe to put their effort in common to develop some new, I would say, tool, service, or uh, products together uh, as a strong Europe to deliver some stuff which can be used not only by your national country but in outside your country for, from the other. So we were part of uh, one uh, one project uh, around uh, around this one, which is called uh, is is up, which uh, you can find also in in the internet. Uh, the goal of this one is what to have a say. Uh, uh, concentrate the data you got from all your uh, systems and you have a, a situational awareness so just you are able to tell the others what's running on your system and take the right decision uh, to, to tackle at the best the, the, the issue and this one is the European consortium is uh, yes research and also uh, uh, industrial partners okay so that's a lot of information that's where we stand today. So we, we saw how the structure of uh, cyber defense uh, has grown uh, in France and has been built uh, through a set of uh, very strong uh, political decisions. And uh, how we in uh, Abbas uh, Cyber have uh, developed our activity to support uh, the, the evolution of our uh, customer needs. But of course, that's not the end of the story. And the stakes are, are, are really changing, evolving uh, every day. So uh, to uh, close this uh, speech, we'll uh, give you a few hints at uh, uh, what we think the stakes will be in, uh, in, the, in different domains in the next years. For defense. So the battlefield in the next decade and probably decades uh, will change and will evolve towards what is called the multi-domain combat cloud. So uh, this is a battlefield where uh, all the headquarters, forces, weapon systems uh, will be connected together in uh, near real time uh, to provide the right information at the right time to the right people. So uh, this creates really new states for cybersecurity because the uh, this is really a uh, digitalization push, push to the, the extreme. And uh, the surface of exposure will, uh, is going to grow uh, really uh, quite a lot. So that will uh, require to develop some uh, cyber defense systems uh, on board the platforms, on board weapon systems, on board uh, aircrafts, on board vehicles, and so on. And uh, we need to, uh, to adapt to new technologies such as the cloud that uh, should be uh, generalized on, uh, on the battlefield. And, and of course, new communication means because the bandwidth uh, requirements will uh, grow uh, quite a lot. So these are the stakes that we are uh, providing to address with our colleagues in uh, Airbus Defense and Space. Uh, at Europe level, we have seen that uh, we yeah, the NIST V1, and currently uh, the, the NIST V2 is currently reviewing uh, by the, the, the European institution, and uh, they, they will enforce uh, one step ago uh, to try to support the critical national industries in Europe to enforce that a, a minimum level of security is part of the design and the run phase of all these industries. So it's really a strong push. They will also tackle the uh, cybersecurity certification of products. So we will have a, a common certification in Europe. So then they, we, we, we're going a little bit closer to your European security market. Uh, versus uh, before we were used to have one security product which has to be certified in each country. You, you, you were forgetting to, to sell almost. There was some cross collaboration, but this one is stronger because they, we, they are pushing for uh, just one label, which is a label security label, which is enforced in the whole Europe. Uh, we have the, the, the EU Cyber Security Act. We have the brand new uh, uh, Cyber Resilience Act, so also which was uh, discussed uh, two weeks before the, the, this talk. So the Europe has a strong strategy and wants to push as well for, I would say, uh, UNI as a citizen, but also the critical national industries to enforce the security and the, the, of the product service uh, uh, which are delivered to everybody inside the European uh, region, I would say. 
about territories, local communities, and SMEs. So, uh, what we saw along the, the last 10 years was that the maturity in terms of cyber security for the big, big actors, large organizations, are, has grown uh, significantly. But at the same time, it's uh, always still more difficult for uh, smaller uh, organizations, for SMEs, and so on, because they uh, they don't have the people, they don't have the, the money, don't have the budget to, uh, to structure their, uh, their uh, protection. Uh, so we saw that, that there were some uh, good initiatives, uh, such as the plan of relance, hein, to, to increase this maturity level. But uh, still, it has to, uh, to be maintained and uh, increased. And uh, it is uh, still, I think, a concern for the years to come. And uh, probably it will... Uh, um, have an impact on future uh, regulations uh, and uh, possibly uh, European directives on, uh, on cyber security. Yeah, human resources, of course, because uh, it's very part of the game. And uh, currently, we, we, we are seeing, uh, when facing the, the COVID crisis, that uh, uh, most of us have the chance to be more remote office rather than uh, in the office. So, uh, uh, most companies are get used to us from time to time people in full remote. So the competition is not only a national one, it's not anymore just a European one uh, for resources, but it's an international one. Uh, we have seen some people which were higher five company who are outside Europe and just you, you don't have the barrier to leave to go uh, in another country. So the, the, the more in the future rather than it was in the past that uh, human resources the, 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 it's not just a national problem. It's uh, yes, we need to enforce the attractivity of uh, what we are doing. We also need to uh, support the fact that we have more young talents which are coming to cybersecurity because we we are missing a lot of resources. So we, we try to go to, uh, to schools to to get uh, and, uh, and, and just put the spirit of cyber, which is fun and interesting stuff, because as a radio a wide landscape that you are able to cover. But also we are pushing for more diversity. Of course, there's a diversity of uh, women in cyber. So there is a association which is Women for Cyber, which we are, uh, we, we are part of. We, we have women which are pushing for, for this one. It's really important, but also the world diversity, not only women. And it's really also a strong push from the side, and we, we try to open as much as possible. But human resources is really uh, key for the future. We need to train and to retain the, the people inside this really interesting topic. And the last point we wanted to um, to highlight is that the cyber is meeting on many topics uh, in a very uh, unending and uh, everybody can do everything. So uh, this is why uh, ecosystems are important to uh, leverage uh, each other's uh, achievements and to be able to uh, to, uh, to get uh, stronger capabilities. So we, we saw them growing the ecosystems uh, through the cyber uh, code of excellence, through the cyber campus, uh, because uh, they are uh, also uh, spreading in, uh, in uh, the whole country. They are already uh, playing a major role in uh, cyber security to, to combine the action of the state, of the industry, or of the academics. But I, I, we, we, what we think is that this is not the end of it, and they will uh, grow even further in the years to come uh, at the national level, but most probably also at, uh, at the European level. And this is it. This was uh, the main uh, highlights and uh, the ma ma main story we wanted to, uh, to tell you today. Hope uh, you learned a few things and, uh, and uh, maybe gave you a, a better overview about uh, how a cyber was structured in France around the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much. Big applause. Um, uh, replacing the real audience uh, with me today. Um, yeah, so, super interesting. And I, I really loved your slides. So this was a very, very nicely crafted and a very nice elements that you put in very nice structure. Um, uh, so Alex will moderate the questions and in order to give him uh, a few more seconds to structure them. Uh, let me start with the first question. 
Um, the first question is, Airbus is uh, truly a European uh, company with uh, Europe, with uh, France and uh, Germany being the, uh, the drivers uh, there. And um, when, when you, we think about cybersecurity, cybersecurity has no frontiers in the sense that uh, French cybersecurity is different from, uh, or has to be different from German cybersecurity because um, French companies are attacked differently than uh, German companies. So. Could, could you say something about the different cultures working on cybersecurity and the different threat landscapes or perceptions in the two countries? Uh, I don't know if you have experience from the two countries, but um, or if not, like in Europe overall, so is there a difference between uh, Hungary, for instance, or France in the perception of cybersecurity threats and in the uh, handling of such threats and the activities that they do? Yes, there's so much to say. <laughs> uh, well, uh, maybe I, I start and uh, you can uh, complement. First thing is that uh, most probably the threat landscape is uh, similar in all countries, for sure. And then there is a matter of perception and there is a matter also of uh, sovereignty because uh, we, uh, uh, both of us are working in the, in the uh, domains that are close to defense, and in both domains, we are working uh, mostly in a, in a national approach, uh, in a national silos, and it's very difficult at the moment to uh, to exchange uh, um, technologies, to exchange uh, uh, projects, know-how between the countries. But uh, still, uh, there are some uh, some new. Uh, elements that uh, allow us to, uh, to work at the Euro European uh, level, and es especially the growth uh, of uh, European Defence Fund is kind of a new thing uh, that it happened only uh, two or three years ago uh, for the first ones. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, um, I think would benefit to, to, uh, to the European cybersecurity on the, the defence uh, uh, because it will allow to have a kind of twofold approach. First, at European level, with things that we can share, and there are things that we can share. And then a second level at national level for things that we don't want to share. And there will, al there will always be things that, uh, that we won't, won't, won't want to share at national level. Nicolas? I'm not sure about what to do out there, except what, yes, we, we are used to have uh, yes, SOX in yes, three main countries, which was uh, France, the UK, and Germany. And at the end of the day, the, the cyber attack doesn't stop at the frontier, then they, they, they go above, and uh, they, we, we are pretty doing the same stuff, the same business in, in each country. Yes, for sure, the, the national, uh, I would say, uh, enforcement and uh, priorities may be a little bit different from one country to another. As we, have, as we have seen that the current regulation is pushing all the countries to uh, try to have a, a minimum, uh, I would say, a good level of security. So everybody uh, try to, to play the, the right game. So I don't think there is so much difference between all countries. The military part is already a, a specific one but for the civilian markets that the, we need to, to tackle a European market together rather than uh, having small silos uh, between each other. But otherwise, they, yes, we are tackling the same issues with the same uh, human resources uh, lacking of people, the same uh, threat which are without any frontiers. So um, no, no big difference at the end of the day. And we are collaborating, yes, quite easily with all those European projects, uh, military or civilian one in uh, Europe, or Europe, for example. The, the consortium is always uh, a lot of people from various countries in Europe and. Uh, we, we managed to deliver great uh, stuff uh, at the end of the day. Yes, uh, that's okay. true that, uh, well, I was uh, focused on the military part, uh, but uh, on big companies such as Airbus, uh, okay, the, yeah, the, the, the internal organization to, uh, for uh, security, uh, for the security uh, activities is really uh, transnational and uh, borders uh, don't don't, uh, don't are not relevant uh, for those organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot for the answer. So, Alex, I hand over to you. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Macron. Talking to both Nicolas for this presentation. 
there were lots of questions, but you proactively answered lots of them, so that's quite convenient. So I will try to regroup them by thematics, I will say. So the first question will be, what role do you see for state and private actors for cyber security? Um, it's possible to rephrase the question because the, the, yeah. it's quite the question I think is, a, is about more uh, does cyber security is more a company affair or or um, state affairs I would answer a question it's, it's an affair of everybody because they currently the, the cyber domain is, is not stopping at the end of your office at the end of the military or governmental uh, offices is going up to your own life so uh, it, there, there is a part of mix between the collaboration between uh, I would say the, the national uh, regulation part and uh, some companies uh, we are seeing during the, the past that uh, for example the APT1 was discovered by a private company which has given some uh, threat in there to the world community. So I really think that, that there is a balance between the both sectors and we, we need, we have to work together for a, a safer cyber security world, I would say. And uh, yes, for sure, the, the national path has a regulation, but uh, the, 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 the industry has uh, the, the path to take, uh, to be part of and to be yes, part of the solution. So that is the place for both, definitely. Okay. Uh, and add, um, um, actually, the, the majority of, uh, of big organizations, private organizations, has, has, has a re reason really dramatically uh, around the last 10 years uh, when we started our, our business in, well, in 2012 or 13. Uh, very few companies knew what a SOC was, for example, and uh, now it's really uh, straightforward. And uh, the company has grown the maturity in terms of risk management and the cyber security risk. I think that in every uh, um, executive committee in, of big companies uh, right now, the, the, the cyber security risk is identified, is seen, is uh, managed at company level. But at the same time, the national institutions, uh, we saw that uh, they are very proactive because they have other uh, uh, objectives. Uh, their objective it was, is to have a, a nation that is working and they don't care whether some companies uh, understand that there is a risk or not. They are putting in place some regulations to to make sure that at uh, the nation level the cyber security risk is handled. So there there is a really the, the need for both. But uh, I think the 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 uh, national authority are there to, to push those who uh, have, did not understand uh, soon, uh, soon enough. Okay. Uh, thank you for this answer. And to complete my former question, uh, there were two questions, I think quite similar. Uh, in France, the military plays a central role for cyber security. How is it in other countries? And the other question was, what is the role of regular citizens regarding cyber security in Europe? So both role of military and regular citizens for cyber security. Yeah. Currently, the, the, there is a very, very difference between the, the military part and the, I would say the European citizen and the, the, uh, some other country like, like France and some in Italy, for example. There's a difference between military parts and civil parts. The, the, the difference of the civil part of the critical national industry is done by some specific institutions which are different than the military ones. So most of the time you have a, a split between the two, which is which is great. So that's, that's my answer. And for the citizen, the, the, the question is, is why, but uh, the, the, I would say the best part is to be aware of what is uh, uh, various uh, phishing or stuff like that. For example, uh, I'm proud that currently uh, the, my, my mother did receive specific uh, messages, which is weird. Uh, she asked no uh, before uh, just click on, on this message. So it, there's uh, an awareness to the world citizen to be aware of what is phishing, what are some minutes, what some threats, I would say, uh, because it's part of the of the, of the game to, to, to raise awareness of everybody. And the other party for us is try to, to get part of the citizen, which are, I 
say, uh, skilled or work, are willing to, to jump into the cyber story to, to be part of the, 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 the industry or the military or the national institution to, to protect their, their, their country in the cyber world, I would say. Okay, thank you for the answer. Another question, which is a bit related but not so much. Uh, do you think it is better to disclose the cybersecurity incidents or to remain silent? I think the question was about if the attacker does not know that you speak about the attack, maybe he have no information, no feedbacks. So it is better to say nothing and uh, uh, correct the attack or just to say everything uh, to uh, share intelligence? I think it's better to share with the community uh, what's running to tell your friends what can happen in their premises uh, so that you, you, you can be less asymmetrical, I would have said, uh, because the attacker may not be able to use the same trick for everybody. Uh, but uh, I won't uh, do it for everything publicly. Uh, we are doing some, uh, I would say, feedbacks uh, after uh, uh, during the, the presentation that we have made a short feedback at, uh, at a symposium for, for the TV5 Monde uh, story. But we are doing so when everything is over and everything is under control. From time to time, uh, there are also legal action which are behind, so we are not allowed to talk about this work. So I, I do really a, a differentiation between, I would say, the public disclosure and in the community of uh, researchers or, uh, or defenders. Uh, but for this community, it's great to share uh, as soon as that you, you are able to share so that they can protect their, I would say, own perimeters. Yeah. Okay. And would you, uh, adding something there, would you say we have enough sharing already? I'm especially thinking about this, um, that we are also working on uh, disclosing cybersecurity information in a way that you do not share the secrets of your company, of your infrastructure, and so on. So automating things in that direction to foster even more sharing, because I personally have the impression that um, there could yet be more increase in this sharing and that would strengthen the defender side. Um, yeah, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, and this is the, the evolution of the regulation in Europe is pushing that uh, national industry has to uh, submit that they are under attack to the national security agencies. And as I said before, the, the European CERT has to uh, do some joint effort and collaboration so they are able through this uh, say, official way of exchanging to exchange and to support their own industry to protect them. So there are already some channels in place to, to those kind of exchanges. Okay, thank you. So now I have two questions about business and money, so I will regroup them. Uh, do you think the investment made in cybersecurity is equivalent to the money raised by cybercrime? So is it enough money, uh, are there, yeah, enough investments by companies in cybersecurity rather than uh, money gain on cyber crimes, on attacks? That's a tough one. <laughs> well, I don't have the figures on uh, cyber crime actually. The, the question on the companies, it's really a question of, uh, of uh, risk management uh, from yeah. my uh, viewpoint, huh? because uh, well, what, what has changed, of course, is that companies are uh, investing uh, quite a lot in uh, in, uh, in cyber uh, security. Uh, we have uh, we had some uh, some practical uh, examples of what cyber security attacks could cost to a company. Uh, if we uh, see at, uh, Renault, Saint Gobain, and so on. And uh, so now the the value of the risk in you know, the 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 executive committees is more or less uh, known. Huh? We know that it's uh, for big, big companies, uh, it's a matter of several hundreds of millions of euros. So that's that's up to this uh, point that the company invests in, uh, in their, in their uh, cyber security. Then to draw a comparison with uh, the, the money from the cyber crime, uh, it's a bit uh, difficult for me. Huh? I don't know if you have uh, a. No, no, I don't have them, uh, well, but you answer only the part of the. Do, do we have enough money? If you tell the, the, the team, they will always claim that they need more money. But the, the reality is uh, that the, we have to put the efforts on uh, through what is pushing, or at least in front of the National Security Agency, which is NSSI, to do the risk analysis, to, to put the efforts at the right level where it's. Because I would say, um, 
but uh, yeah, I cannot uh, answer a fully to the question. Actually. Sorry for that. Okay, thank you, Professor. A few questions now about uh, the targets of cyber attacks. Uh, are small or medium companies more targeted by cyber attacks than big, big groups? And uh, what is the most targeted industry for ransomware and why? Honestly, frankly speaking, I don't have the figures with me. Uh, I, I don't know them by heart, so I can't ask for uh, an avoiding to, to do a mistake. But uh, there is two types of attack. I would say some are really targeting some industry. It's not a question of sectors, it's a question of uh, uh, can you access to the industry for a ransom and uh, is it bankable, I would have said. Uh, and so some group are just targeting some specific industry sector who delivers some product with added value with a, a huge business. Some others are the, just trying to like scripted is uh, just scanning the internet if there is a vulnerability which is open inside the internet they will try to use it and after uh, if you, you don't have a, a, a huge I would say turnover I uh, will claim for a low amount if you have a, a huge one I will claim for a huge one it's more opportunistic so you have both uh, in the cyber crime and uh, I said it's unfortunately there is no big blocker for that uh, it, it, you have various people which are doing various cyber crime at both levels the, the okay. Now I uh, have a few questions again. Uh, there will be uh, a bit of geopolitical question, I will say. Uh, did the situation in Ukraine affect your work? Did it introduce new priorities or challenges, especially as Airbus is also active in the defense sector? Uh, we don't comment on geopolitical stuff, so okay. I won't take this question, sorry. Okay. And uh, there's one another, I don't know, quite general question about, do you know what are the countries that are the more attacked and the countries that are, that attacks us more? <laughs> I think it's still the same on Twitter, the other side, and that the wound okay. in, my, in my mind. Uh, I cannot answer without any mistakes, sorry for that. Okay, no problem. So more general question. So uh, who is the target group for fake news? Who is the target group for fake news? Who, I think who is targeted sure by spreading it. fake news? So the, que the question goes into the direction, is it more um, public bodies? Is it general public? Is it companies? Because uh, when you go to uh, these different entities, you might um, see different types of fake news. Is there trends that you see uh, that today it's mainly general public for manipulating elections or it's as uh, intelligence community to, to deviate uh, their information? I don't know if you, can, if you have some experience there or if you can disclose something in that direction. Come on. Yeah, on my side, I don't have the figures of the well, targeted group. Actually, this okay. is not, um, not the, the out of our uh, business, uh, this information. This is beginning to be part of our business, especially on the military side, because this is quite new. And I think that on the, the, uh, the private sector side, it's already something that, uh, that was uh, where, where the companies are uh, more mature because uh, they need to, uh, to um, well, they pay uh, attention to the social networks uh, because it can affect their business and so on. The, the, the risk is very wide and large and because it can be a risk uh, both on, uh, on the, the value of their uh, uh, sh shares. Uh, yeah. It can be a risk on, on their image. It can be a risk on a uh, lot yeah. of things, really. We are already seeing several times that just a simple tweet can change the, the, the share value from a company. So yeah. it's part of the influence, but uh, we, we cannot share figures because we don't have them. And some are just private, I would say, under the radars. Those which are more public, we have from time to time some examples, but uh, most of the time this is the companies themselves or the, the government which are got the, I would say, the right scoring, but we, we don't have access to the full picture of this one. But, uh, but on the military side, it's really uh, new and it's spreading and it's very effective because uh, uh, in uh, 
spreading rumors on a few uh, social networks, uh, you can have the local manipulate actually people and manipulate a lot of people inside the local population so that they get out of, out of their home and they stop a military convoy. So that's really very uh, effective and uh, very uh, uh, cheap, <laughs> actually. So uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, that is, uh, will grow in uh, in the future for, for sure. It's very difficult also to uh, fight against because it's a matter of um, of hours to react. Once the rumor is widespread, then it's too late. It's too late to uh, to answer. It's too late for communication. It's too late to to contain it uh, also. Okay. So now we have only three questions, and the two last one will be quite funny, in my opinion. So the first one is: What is the role of certification for cybersecurity? The main role of certification for cybersecurity is to ensure that you have raised your product or your services at a minimum level, which is expected. And uh, in the European scheme, you have several levels of uh, yes, the cyber, uh, uh, I would say, uh, level uh, from one to, to three, which have different names. But the target is to, to have a proof uh, that the product has been, or the service has been evaluated by an external body. Uh, without any influence, so you will have at the end of the system that is proving that you have uh, reached the expected level, that's the target. So give, the, having more trust, I would say, exactly. that's, that's the right one, that's trust. It's a trust. Can, to use a speed provider or, or device to protect you, you need to trust it, and that's what the certification provides. Okay, thank you. So, a question about your timeline that you've presented. So, it begins in the 2008 year, and there were two questions about quite old, I will say now, uh, attacks. The Y2K bug or, vi or virus, as we cannot, uh, it can be abused, and the I love you worm. So, wasn't this kind of a problem a security, cybersecurity issues? And does Airbus have, uh, have been asked to answer? This kind of issues, so the Y2K bug and the I love you worm. Uh, for, for, for the first part, we, we have decided to start uh, around 2008, I would say, because the, it was part of the beginning of the, of the journey for, for a company because uh, we have said it then we have started uh, a center of competence, but in fact, there is already a first, uh, I would say, almost start or early beginning a uh, few years before. We can have started, uh, I would say, 20 years ago with all the virus attacks, but it was not the purpose of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, some very highlighted uh, stuff, which have, um, were just tackling some specific, yes, Estonia, it was a whole country uh, against a, a huge uh, denial of service, which had changed uh, the, 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 what has done this in the after. Uh, the other sabotage was very strong. Uh, sabotage was targeting at the beginning some specific industries, uh, whereas some others, of, uh, such as the bug of Y2K or I Love You, does to be targeting uh, some existing stuff. So it's, that's the reason why we choose this example, only, uh, because it was very uh, a big stress on some, uh, I've said, dedicated uh, target or action or of means. Uh, rather than uh, generic uh, vulnerabilities, which we have seen, we, we can have added, I would say, hundreds of uh, of malware. This was not the, the target of the presentation. Okay. And to conclude, the um, public questions, even if there were more, but some of them were answered, as I said, by your presentation. Uh, when will we have 100% cybersecurity? That's an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, it will it will always be a, a target for uh, the, the world industry, world sector, world products. But uh, we are an evolving world, and uh, an evolving world is also an evolving IT. So we will have also evolving threat over time. So I would say, unfortunately, we will still have a, a business, a, a job to, to support cybersecurity over time. Uh, because I think, unfortunately, it's a kind of endless obese uh, we we will still have to fight against in, uh, in this moving world. So it's a permanent fight. 
Okay, thank you for your answers, and back to you, Marco Oliva. For kind of, uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful discussion. And the time is the time is almost up. I just want to profit with a last um, personal question for both of you, maybe. What is the most positive memory you have from these ten years? So something that happened uh, that you would want to highlight that uh, that was really nice in this journey creating Amber Cybersecurity. You already talked about the people, and that I can only confirm. So with everybody I'm working with, that uh, Amber Cybersecurity is always a pleasure, um, exchanging and driving ideas and spinning ideas. So it's it's a really great opportunity, and thanks a lot um, for that. So. What, what would you say? It, it can be a funny thing. It can be any minor thing. So do you have do you have a highlight that you would a personal highlight that you would want to emphasize? Uh, it's a difficult one because uh, there are uh, lots of memories uh, over the the last ten years. Uh, do you have an idea on your side, uh, Nicolas? Uh, I would say I'm not sure it's a funny one, but uh, I've talked a little bit about uh, TV five uh, mode. Uh, for me, it was a specific event because uh, I would say, yes, it was a crisis. It's not great for, for the, the one which is under attack, but uh, um, I had the chance to be part of this. And when I said this, it was part of the remediation, uh, and which was really great because we were doing part of crisis management and remediation. And this can only be done with the human you are with you. And this was really specific because uh, the, I said we were not counting our hours you know, on premises, but everybody, despite the situation, was always in a good mood and in a, in a way to try to uh, say fight against the, the threat and to deliver the, the services so we can recover. So it was for me a, a human experience because uh, under pressure, so you, you, you can have, I would say, some which are together and want to fight together against the, the, I said the the threat and so those of may uh, yes i would say try to find who is guilty why the reason why i don't know but it was really a human adventure everybody inside the company uh, in the airbus for all the team because we have a lot of remote people uh, in airbus working on this one and inside the the, the team from tv5 because uh, everybody was yes close together we were really one joint team with all the suppliers and uh, the, 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 the was just uh, delivering something against I would say the, the cyber crime. So, yeah. It's, uh, on my side, I, I had the time. Thank you, Nicolas. I had the time to think about it. So that's not a very necessarily a very good memory, but uh, that's a memory about people also, uh, because um, that's when the actually the the COVID crisis started, uh, and uh, uh, we are. Uh, a very sensitive business. We are working on uh, military uh, uh, programs and so on. And then uh, from the day to the other, we, we were asked to leave our, uh, our uh, offices and to try to make the business uh, carry on. And actually it worked uh, owing to the, the people and the fact that they, they found uh, solutions and uh, that, that we just never thought about uh, before to work from their uh, from their own and ensure the business continuity. So that's a very uh, marking uh, memory for me. Yeah, very nice, very nice. So yeah, as I said before, so for me it was uh, super interesting and super great uh, seeing the, the journey, the highlights of the journey that you picked, and also seeing the outlook of uh, different areas that, that might be uh, interesting ones in the in the upcoming years. Um, I think we can all say that, as, as you already said, also cybersecurity will continue being important. It will grow in importance, and therefore we'll uh, probably not be unemployed. And uh, we are also always looking for talents <laughs> on, uh, on both sides. So yeah, <laughs> this is sure. Cool. So thanks again. A big applause also here. We had uh, quite some audience. We still had uh, some uh, some more questions. Thanks a lot to Alex uh, for the great moderation. Thanks a lot to Renzo for the moderation of the YouTube stream. Um, as usual, the video will be available online um, directly after. So uh, please share it also with your friends. So subscribe to the channel and uh, yeah, look at it again. And uh, also we'll put some more questions to the video or send us your questions and uh, we'll forward them to uh, Nicolas, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll have some interesting discussion. The next edition, or also important, a 
possibility if you want to meet us will be at the European Cyber Week, which will be on from the 15th to the 17th of November. We will all be in uh, REN, and this is a big cybersecurity event in REN. The Apples will have a stand there. We as the chair will probably also have the possibility to be present on the 16th of November, uh, which is a Wednesday. We'll have even a dedicated session for the chair also with Airbus and our other industry partners. So if you manage to come to REN, if you're interested in cybersecurity, meeting companies, discussing on the issues, continuing the discussion with us, do not miss it. Come over. The participation in the event is free. You have to register, but you can come over and participate. So uh, we highly recommend that and cordially invite you to do so. And uh, yeah, next edition of the series will be on the 21st of October. At uh, 2 o'clock, we'll have Gabi Drio from the University of Armed Forces. I'll produce the trailer with her in the next week, so it will be also online then. Take care, um, stay safe, and uh, see you all in uh, two weeks. Uh, thanks again to Nicolas Razi and Nicolas Lorio. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Cher Cyber CN, Hall d'excellence, Région Cyber. Bretagne. Au revoir et à la prochaine.